on GeoServer and, and GeoTools. Uh, and today is going to tell us about um, serving uh, large, how to serve large geopackage datasets uh, in GeoServer, EOS Master Map and ZoomStack use case. Okay, over to you, Andrea. Thank you. Okay, so you can hear me and uh, the slides are on, right? Yes, yes. Good. So yeah, welcome everybody. I'm going to talk about uh, serving large geo packages uh, in, in GeoServer. So first, uh, a quick shout out to my, uh, to my company. Uh, GeoSolutions has offices in Italy and the United States, uh, serves worldwide clients. It's a tech strong company with 25 plus engineers out of 30 collaborators. Uh, supports a number of open source projects, including GeoServer, GeoNode, GeoNetwork, MapStore and provides uh, support services, deployment, uh, customized solution, training, bug fixing, new features and whatnot around these projects. We are strong supporters for open source GIS and open standards. So we participate in OGC and we also support the standards critical to GeoInt. Now, let's talk about this, uh, this activity that we performed with OGC during testbed 16. Uh, during the testbed 16 geo package thread, we looked into uh, two ways to improve the usage of geo packages. Uh, one, uh, thread, one thread aspect was to improve the discoverability uh, of the contents of a geo package and the usability in general. And the other one was about supporting large vector data sets because uh, we hear, we heard that, uh, that there are difficulties as the uh, size of the geo package goes up. Uh, during testbed 16, we provided a uh, geo server with uh, a WPS process called the geo package that generates geo packages. Uh, we had the geo packages also sitting on the back to do um, get maps and the like on WMS. And we also had a post GIS data source, uh, which was our main source of truth for uh, the WPS process. All the changes that we, um, all, all the code that we developed uh, has been contributed uh, both to GeoTools and GeoServer. Uh, all the core changes went into the GeoTools GeoPackage module for everyone to use, even outside the GeoServer. And the experimental extensions went into the uh, GeoServer WPS GeoPackage module because it's a community module and it's a better place to have uh, extensions which are not, uh, let's say, official. Now, let's go into content discovery improvements. Uh, the GeoServer WPS uh, process, uh, the GeoPackage process, was already there and was already able to export uh, complex GeoPackages with multiple layers, a mix of raster and vector, controlling contents by filtering, and deciding whether or not to add indexes. So from a, a data standpoint, the process was fairly complete. However, it did not add any meta information. T uh, during the activities of testbed 16, we added the ability to export linked metadata, dataset provenance, styles, and common operational picture. And if you don't know what uh, common operational picture is, well, I didn't know either, but I'm going to explain. Uh, to do that, we um, used a bunch of uh, GeoPackage extensions. GeoPackage as a standard has a core spec and a number of extensions that add uh, well, extra tables into, into the geo package. And uh, we use the metadata extensions, which is a, a core extension. So the, even the core spec has a bunch of extensions at the bottom. And uh, a couple of experimental extensions, which are the portrayal extension and the semantic annotation extension. So first off, uh, we proceeded to embed linked metadata. So when you configure a data set in GeoServer, uh, you might know that you can link to external metadata, such as an ISO sheet, for example, which can be sitting wherever on the internet. And uh, in the capabilities, we provide a link to it. Now, one of the use cases of downloading a geo package is to uh, support an online offline workload in which at least some part of the time you are not online. So it makes sense to embed the metadata inside the geo package rather than uh, linking to it. So what happens is that uh, we uh, 
download the ISO metadata sheet. We create a record in the GeoPackage metadata table uh, with, the, with the contents, and then we link it to the layers through the GeoPackage metadata reference table, uh, specifying whether it's uh, metadata for the entire GeoPackage, and there can be, uh, or if it's uh, a table by, ta by table uh, situation, like in this case. In this case, we had the same metadata linked from various tables, so only one record was created. Semantic annotations are a, a, a tricky thing. A semantic annotation is a tag. is a tag that can tag a table or a row in the table, giving it extra meaning. Think of it as a post-it that you attach to a table or a, to a record to tag it uh, to enhance its semantic. So you can say something like, oh, this metadata entry here is actually uh, a WFS request, so a way to re-download again the original data of the geo package, for example. Uh, a, cre a creative use of semantic annotations is to tag at the same time with the same annotation two items in the database. That forms uh, an association between them, which can be used to uh, create associations in the geo package without creating lots of uh, uh, relational tables in, in, the, in, the mean, in the between to, uh, to, work, uh, to work in a relational way. Um, with this, we started adding the provenance. The provenance was added into the metadata uh, table as a record, uh, encoded as a GeoJSON OWS context. Do you remember the map context documents of many years ago? Well, nowadays there is a, a GeoJSON encoding for them and they are OWS contexts, so they talk about more than just maps. And uh, uh, we added that, uh, that uh, context document into the metadata table and then used the semantic annotations to say, oh yeah, this is a dataset provenance. And uh, uh, there is a specific uh, type, an enumeration of possible values that uh, identifies it as a provenance. Uh, as part of provenance, we also include the original request that generated the package. So again, it's the OWS context plus a semantic annotation, and uh, I'm not sure if you can read, but uh, here uh, we have a, a, an offering of a WPS service with a get capabilities, a describe process for the process that we used, and the execute body that was actually used to dump the, the geo package. This allows the potential client to go offline later on and say, mm, what if uh, there has been some changes and eventually go back to the server, use the WFS to download the original data and eventually use the WPS to download them uh, in uh, um, geo package format. Another interesting bit that we normally lose when exporting data are styles. So styles in GeoServer are linked from the, the configuration of the layers, and uh, we use the portrayal extensions to actually save them into an extra table, which is called GeoPackageX styles, uh, and, uh, well, have the, the full style available for offline usage when just uh, adding access to the GeoPackage itself. Now, it can be interesting to notice that, uh, 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 especially for a service that generates geo packages for uh, uh, a variety of clients, a single style can be encoded uh, in multiple languages. For example, I could have the same style encoded in both Mapbox GL and SLD. So there is a dedicated separate table for the style sheets, uh, which allows us to have a notion of a style and maybe have two encodings, two style sheets attached to it one in SLD and one in another language. However, just storing the styles, the XML or the JSON that defines the style is not enough. Why? Because much of the, sim the, the styles use symbologies such as PNGs, SVGs, fonts and whatnot to uh, perform the rendering. So there are dedicated tables, GeoPackageX symbols, that allow to also store all the symbology that is needed and related to the style so that the offline map renderer can load the style, can load uh, the symbology and perform a rendering which is a good match of what you would get online 
but when working offline. Um, okay, so the portrayal extension uh, is a good start. It saves the style and it uh, saves the symbology. It doesn't say which style goes with which layer. For that, we used uh, semantic annotations. So the, we used a, a single semantic annotation to tag both the style and the layer in such a way as to create an, an association between them. It can be that the same style can be used with multiple layers uh, or that the, the same layer can use multiple styles. And uh, well, the, the semantic annotation mechanism allows to do that um, without the necessity to, to create many extra relationship tables. Now, uh, let's say that we have a geo package with multiple layers inside. We already uh, take, we have already taken care of associating styles with layers, which is great. But what about staking order? What about uh, uh, creating a map out of the geo package? Well, sure, you can just load the, the layers and try to place them in some order until the map looks good. But it would be nice if the geo package contained already that information. This is known as common operational picture, which in, in GeoServer uh, terms is also known as layer group. So a uh, notion of a definition of a list of layers and the list of styles that form a, a suitable map. And I could have many, like uh, if my data set talks about uh, OpenStreetMap, for example, I could have a view for, for a night, one for day, one colorful, one gray, and so on. So if we have a definition of groups, of layer groups in GeoServer, those are also going to be exported as common operational pictures. Um, uh, sorry. Just a second. I need to mute here. OK, we were saying common operational picture. The common operational picture, picture is, guess what? Again, an OWS context uh, document, which, well, they can be pretty, pretty rich. Um, and uh, uh, in this case, we say something like, oh, yeah, so we, uh, we're going to take uh, uh, all the data from topographic area and put it together with a style which we can get with this query against the style sheets and so on. And uh, as a client uh, parses this uh, common operational picture, it can generate uh, a suitable map, one or more of them. Okay, so this closes the discoverability and uh, offline usage use case of the testbed 16. But as I told you, we had another uh, objective, large geo packages. So, Ordinance Survey, which uh, uh, was the uh, one of the sponsors of this activity, was kind enough to throw at us 50 gigabytes worth of compressed GML files, uh, which make the, the master map topo topography map. It's a very, very detailed map of all the United Kingdom meant to be displayed at 1 to 4,000 and just at 1 to 4,000. So it's like a printed map. Uh, it grows into 300 gigabytes when imported into PostGIS. There are a couple of open source tools developed in the United Kingdom that you can use. They are plugins to, to QGIS that uh, they take the GMLs and uh, generate the Postgres tables for you. Now, uh, there are a few catches. Several of the attributes have a multiplicity greater than one, and they are typically uh, exported in PostgreSQL as arrays. For example, an history of changes is uh, um, saved as, uh, uh, as an array. Also, several attributes are enumerated. So they are encoded as strings. But if you look at them, there are maybe just 50 possible values out of 300 million records. Uh, so there is a chance to, to optimize there. So uh, also, there are multiple styles available on GitHub. And the resulting geo package is very, very large, 250 gigabytes, a bit smaller than PostgreSQL. I'm going to talk about it uh, as, as to why later. Our objectives were how to make it smaller, how do we read it faster? So first off, 
uh, we looked at all these um, duplication of information with the enumerated uh, attributes. And we found out that in the GeoPackage core specification, there is a schema extension that can be used to represent the list of attributes that are in a, in a table and give a bit more information about those attributes, more than just saying this column is a string. The schema extension uh, already had a notion of an enumeration. So we can say, oh, okay, the, um, the accuracy of position enumeration can have values uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, and the description of them is going to be 1 meter, 2.5 meters, 6 meters, 8 meters, and so on. So we basically use that to re-encode the tables so that for every enumerated uh, value, we were actually using, uh, sorry, here, uh, we were actually using a number. And that already trimmed quite a bit of uh, space. Then we had a second challenge all these arrays attributes, which, uh, well, they can be represented natively in PostgreSQL because there is, a, there is an array uh, column, but there isn't in uh, uh, SQLite. And, uh, well, geopackages are SQLite databases. However, uh, we found out that uh, most of the builds do include the JSON-1 extension of SQLite, which allows to treat the contents of a column as a JSON uh, uh, document, and uh, they provide a number of uh, functions to work with it. So what we did was to turn each array into a JSON array, and if it happened to have enumerated value, to turn the enumerations into uh, integers. So uh, what happened? Uh, it, the database in PostgreSQL was 300 gigabytes. The geo package with no fancy uh, tricks was uh, 245 gigabytes. The significant reduction is due to the different target of the two databases. PostgreSQL is meant to be an operational database at large volumes, and uh, it favors uh, speed over space uh, consumption on disk. SQLite has been born for embedded usage, so it has exactly the, the, the opposite um, approach. It tries to minimize the space used to represent information at the cost of speed. Uh, when adding the enumerations, we went down to 206 gigabytes, which is a nice improvement, uh, 40 gigabytes less to transfer and, and process during queries. OK, so extracting data from this larger geo package, even at 200 gigabytes, uh, was slow. And uh, um, visualization at 1 to 4,000 means that we are literally displaying a drop out of the sea. Only a tiny part was needed. So uh, of course, there is the spatial index. It was pretty slow to, to use. It could take, uh, for an Android device uh, loaded with the geo package, even a minute to display uh, a part. And then once you, you had the display, a move, panning around was reasonably fast, but the first, the first access was uh, really miserable. Uh, so we stole a page from uh, OSM importers and from PostgreSQL and looked into sorting the, the records by space using geohash. If you sort, if you compute the geohash of the geometries and you sort on that, uh, you end up with uh, uh, close by, spatially close by geometries, which are also close by on disk. Uh, and that, uh, of course, helps a lot if you have a spinning disk, uh, because uh, you avoid all the seeks around. However, we found out that it's really useful also for SSDs. I run all my tests only on SSDs, and it was faster anyways. The reason is simple. Even from an SSD, you read a block. and uh, if uh, your information is spread out, you have to read many blocks. But if it's compacted in a small space, you have to read a smaller number of blocks. So you still have less I.O. with this approach. Uh, we run a benchmark uh, to, uh, to, do, to do this. And uh, we run get maps on, uh, 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 on, uh, on, on master map. Uh, 
com uh, comparing hot and cold benchmarks and we found out that uh, the uh, geohash sorted um, data was always faster even significant mm, quite significantly uh, so so we proved that even with ssds it's best to sort on geohash another take that we that we had was to index the uh, to create an index geo package so instead of trying to optimize access to the large 200 uh, gigabytes geo package we said why don't we split it into smaller parts so we have a master geo package that uh, links to child geo packages and we follow a splitting pattern uh, of the 100 kilometers uk grid so the the extension basically points to uh, all the files that contain any data for that particular table and it might happen that in one particular tile you don't have any data for one for one particular table in that case the record is skipped so that's why for example here we only have a 46 uh, entries out of uh, 50 something zones it's because boundary line doesn't actually show up in all of uh, these zones and that also helped a lot because you can do a very quick index access on the uh, index uh, geo package and then go and hit a, a much smaller geo package um, there's only one uh, one issue following a uh, regular pattern means that uh, densely inhabited areas where like uh, i don't know uh, 20 gigabytes where uh, uh, small islands in the north were like uh, two megabytes so as much as uh, having a uh, regular pattern is nice it's uh, it's still a good idea to maybe use a different pattern <coughs> that splits uh, a, a zone further if it's too big we have another use case which is the zoom stack zoom stack it's a free geo package that you can download for an ordinary survey it's a deeply multi-scale data set so you can see the entire country or our a detail it's 10 gigabytes and it contains many layer now uh, from uh, this point of view we stole a page from again the OpenStreetMap importers and said okay why don't we have uh, generalized tables generalized tables are not just containing generalized geometries that's one part of the approach but more importantly they only contain the records that do display at a given scale range so we have this uh, index uh, that uh, uh, basically tells the system which generalized table to use at which scale denominator and as i said it's very important to reduce the, uh, the record count we again did tests and especially on the android device which is underpowered uh, we had up to 300 times speed up factors uh, displaying the map of course uh, all the work was based on uh, vector data but we also uh, we also have rasters and uh, it happened that we uh, we got the sentinel 2 cloudless uh, geo package from eox which is one raster layer but it's a bit big it's 500 gigabytes it's a pyramid with 13 zoom levels and 180 million tiles we found out that at the beginning it was uh, pretty slow to access uh, but we uh, well there were some queries that were added into into the access of tiles to uh, to save some code really uh, that we eliminated and now it's uh, it's also blazing faster so uh, with the latest versions of uh, your server uh, don't worry you can uh, also open these uh, massive raster geo packages we also did uh, a few old school optimizations such as uh, uh, switching the database in a read-only mode uh, um, we also tried the memory mapping but it didn't seem to help at least not on uh, on the server side on uh, on geo server and uh, we also made uh, as much optimization as possible to write it faster because our server was producing the larger geo packages so when creating it we set, up, set it up for exclusive access disable the transactional journal disable transactions use the batches of inserts and again memory mapping did not seem to help but the, the rest did quite a bit and we we uh, reduced the, the writing time uh, a few times okay thanks for watching if you want more details i invite you to go to the ogc website and look at the geo package engineering report 
And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Uh, I, I, I would love to, to hear more about this, but unfortunately, I, I would like to leave some time uh, for questions as well. Um, I think we don't have any any question right now. Uh, so in the meantime, I'm well, people are uh, preparing something, maybe. I would like to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. So um, the the Geo Package Working Group uh, at OGC is a uh, is working on the possibility of abstracting the the Geo Package standard from a specific uh, database from SQLite. Right. Um, how do you think, or do you have any idea, given your experience, uh, that this how this could impact the performance of uh, reading a Geo Package? Let's say that you have a Postgres backend on uh, an Oracle backend, mm -hmm. uh, how different would it be? Uh, from uh, my experience, question. it seems that the spatial indexes in SQLite could use work. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the access path that uh, most evidently slows down when you add data is the spatial search by bounding box. So, on one side, I hope that SQLite gets a, a more performant R3 implementation. On the other side, I think that if we move the, the same uh, uh, structure to PostgreSQL, we are going to solve at least partially the problem. That said, some of the tricks such as geohash sorting are very much recommended uh, in guides uh, about importing OSM into PostgreSQL. So the problem is, is there as well. I mean, having a, a good, Disk structure helps a lot in in terms of uh, access, in, in terms of uh, improving the performance of access. Okay, and uh, th these experiments, th these uh, tweaks that you did uh, during the test bed, were they incorporated in a um, Geo server uh, for for accessing the Geo package, or this is something experimental? Um, uh, so we, we kept everything we could into the supported part of the geo package uh, functionality, but some bits such as the semantic annotations for trial extension, that is style support basically, and uh, also the common operational pictures, uh, you know, anything that, that needs semantic annotations ended up in the geo package community module, which is the WPS process that can write the geo packages. We don't want to bring it to supported land because in GeoServer supported means also preserving backwards compatibility and uh, <laughs> having a, a spec that can change is a, is a problem. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Oh, uh, I think there are no more questions. So thank you very much, Andrea, for a fantastic presentation, uh, fantastic you. work, and, um, and we'll move to the, to the next speaker. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.